I'm now delighted, speaking about pharmacists, I'm now delighted to introduce Penny Wood. Now, Penny is both a practitioner of pharmacy and a lecturer of pharmacy, and uh, lectures at La Trobe Bendigo, and is working in the uh, Western Victoria uh, PHN, which uh, I guess goes from Geelong Lara, where does it start? Geelong-ish Geelong to the border-ish. Yep. Up to Mildura or not? Have I in the other one? Okay. So a fair chunk of this big state of Victoria. So kind of very useful to have Penny here, apart from the fact that she's driven a lot of work with the PHN and has also got a broader interest in opioid management, undertaking a PhD in it, and that includes both OTC and, and prescription opiates, so your schedule your, your schedule fours and your schedule eights. And I guess can see it from both the pharmacist's point of view, the public health network point of view, but also elements, and we'll come back to this later on, from a rural and remote point of view. So absolutely delighted to have Penny here. So I was asked today to present on alternatives um, to codeine in the pharmacy, so other options we have when patients have previously used codeine or um, requesting codeine. So this has mostly already been covered, but just as a bit of an overview, um, codeine is a weak, short-acting opioid which achieves its analgesic action through conversion to morphine in the liver. As John mentioned, a lot of people aren't aware of this and are surprised when you actually mention this to them. Some people don't realise codeine is even an opioid or that things like Neurofin Plus actually have codeine in them. So there's um, a lot of misinformation and lack of health literacy out there in the, in the community. Um, also, as John um, um, mentioned, there's lots of variability with the, with the um, conversion to morphine. So only about 5 to 15% of a dose of codeine is actually metabolised to morphine. And then um, the variability with, with different groups of being able to do that. Um, and despite the huge concern out there in society with the scheduling changes, codeine is rarely, if at all, first-line therapy for, for a lot of um, conditions. Um, it's actually recommended to try single ingredient preparations first, so your single paracetamol, aspirin or um, NSAIDs, and of course all um, non-drug therapies for pain, all pain types should also be explored. I think it's also important to be starting to have this conversation now as pharmacists with your patients about the um, unavailability of codeine, just because um, patients still can have that security blanket of having the codeine available as a backup, so it's really good time to say, hey, have you thought about trying this? I'll still give you your panadine maybe as a backup, but how about we try this first and then if this doesn't work, we can use another option. And I think that's, that's a good way of getting patients to perhaps change their thinking and willing to try other things. All right, so this I stole off Malcolm Dobbin. It's a, um, a little chart um, he created. So Malcolm Dobbin, sorry, works for the Department of Health here in Victoria. Um, it's a little chart he created on... Um, from a summary of Cochrane reviews about the numbers needed to treat to get benefit from different medications. And as you can see, um, combination ibuprofen and paracetamol is, is quite good. Um, ibuprofen and codeine is less, less effective. And ibuprofen by itself is quite similar to the ibuprofen and codeine showing that the ibuprofen, I mean the codeine probably doesn't have a lot more um, benefit over the top of um, plain ibuprofen. I think as pharmacists also it's important for us to remember when someone comes in requesting medications or with painful conditions to remember our appropriate questioning, especially if it's a direct product request. We tend to, you know, have you had it before, what's the pain, here you go. Um, and it's important to, to delve into what actually more information about, about the pain to find something that's probably more appropriate. So we need to make sure we're asking where the pain is, you know, is it severe, moderate, mild? scale of 1 to 10, the nature, so is it is it throbbing, is it burning, is it stabbing, um, how long has it happened for, when is it occurring, is it occurring all the time, or only when you do certain things, are there other symptoms that go along with the pain, so shortness of breath, um, swelling, any other symptoms, what things make it worse, what relieves it, what makes, what aggravates it. Um, what are the medications and medical conditions and could that be a source of the pain? So such as um, medication withdrawal headaches and things like that. And is there any alarming symptoms or anything that indicates that we need to refer straight away? 
Um, so I've just gone over a few of the conditions that I, um, I believe most often we get requests for combination analgesics containing codeine for in the pharmacy. Um, so one of these is um, migraine. Um, and I think it's really important in migraine that we're treating at the first sign of symptoms. One of the um, issues with migraine is that the stomach actually shuts down. So then any medication we're taking is not going to be absorbed as well. And that's why um, a good option, I guess, is aspirin, soluble aspirin, because it is absorbed um, a lot quicker and more readily. So um, um, aspirin 900 milligrams is an option that we can offer in the pharmacy as a first line for migraine. And then, of course, your other anti-inflammatories and paracetamol. And again, a soluble option is a good option. Um, I had an example of this with a patient um, recently came into the pharmacy, had travelled down from Ballarat to Geelong, had a migraine because of the light in the car, left her tablets at home, came in to talk to me about, um, can I have some panadine? That's what I usually take for my migraine. And I spoke to her about the codeine changes um, and suggested that maybe she like, might like to try aspirin um, because of you know the stomach shutting down and it, it would be more easily absorbed. And she said to me, no one's ever actually suggested that to me before. No one's ever recommended. I've suffered from migraines 10 plus years and no one's actually ever recommended that to me before. And she was more than happy to take it and try it. I'll give that a try. She actually asked me. I didn't even have to offer. She goes, can I try that? And it's like, sure. So I think as pharmacists, we need to be mindful of, of this again with that direct request. When someone requests a product, they don't necessarily know about other options and we forget about that. I had another example where a patient came in um, I was locating in my brother's pharmacy up in Yarrawonga and they requested Nurofen Plus. And I said to them, so, so have you used this before? No, no, no. So why, why are you particularly requesting this? My daughter uses it and she told me to come and get it. So there was no reason for him to be actually trying Nurofen Plus. So we actually started off with ibuprofen by, by itself. He was quite happy with that. Came back in the next day, checked with him how it was going and it was fine. It helped. So I think we need to remember we're the health professionals. <laughs> and they're the patients, they're just coming off potentially what someone else has used, what their family and friends have used, so it's up to us to have that professional role and actually decide what's best and what other options there might be available. And again, they may not realise that there are other options available. Okay. Um, <coughs> also in the pharmacy, um, if they're not getting a good response from that medication, we can actually offer them anti-emetic drugs to help that gastric motility and help with the absorption. So metoclopramide is available with paracetamol for, for use for migraine as an S3. So that's an option that we can give. And also we've got um, prochlorperazine available in the pharmacy for migraine as well. So that's another option that we can give. And again, if it's a non-migraine headache, I think it's really important to actually explore the underlying cause of the headache, you know, whether it's dehydration, um, injury, stress, eye strain, alcohol. No one here's ever had a headache from alcohol. Um, medication overuse, it might be cough, it could be hormonal. So it's really important to, to um, explore that underlying reason and perhaps treat that rather than be just be treating the, the headache. And then, of course, if it's an ongoing thing, then it should be referred. It shouldn't be managed in the pharmacy. It should be referred further. And I remember when I was a young intern pharmacist, we had a patient, um, Missindol, chronic user of Missindol, coming in all the time. We tried to get her to go to the doctor all the time. She wouldn't, she wouldn't, she wouldn't. And in the end, she ended up having um, eyesight trouble. So we said, right, no, you really, really need to go to the doctor. And she had a brain tumour. And by that stage, it was too late. So it's really, really important that, you know, if it's that ongoing use, then we really need to refer. So another thing that's commonly um, requested, Neurofin Plus is commonly requested for, is primary dysmenorrhea. Um, so um, NSAIDs are a really good option here because it's the prostaglandins released by the endometrial cells at the start of the menstruation that cause the vasoconstriction, muscle contraction and compression of the spiral arteries and that leads to that, that cramping and pain. Um, so if we inhibit the prostaglandins, which what NSAIDs do, that can help with the pain. So NSAIDs best given 48 hours before menstruation is expected, if they're on a regular cycle, or with as soon as the onset of the pain starts. Um, treatment continued for 48 to 72 hours. 
are when um, the prostaglandin release is maximal. Um, and there's insufficient evidence to favour one NSAID over another, even though marketing tends to do so. <laughs> so with your pond stands and things like that, there's actually no evidence that one's better than the other. And of course, if it's secondary dysmenorrhea, then it actually should be referred for, for further investigation. Um, I work with someone that works in youth drug and alcohol, um, and she said they have a lot of young women actually come in for detox or withdrawal who've become addicted to Nurofen Plus because of menstruation um, issues, um, because they've started it off when they're, they're young, in their early teens. Um, someone's recommended it, family, friend, pharmacist, whoever, and then what's happened is at that time, young women are also going through a lot of potential anxiety issues, trying to find their way in the world, and the, the codeine's actually helped with that as well, so then they've become dependent, dependent on it. So they're not just taking small amounts, they end up taking more and more and more, and that can be problematic. So um, codeine's not indicated at all in primary dysmenorrhea. Um, from my own experience, I had um, severe period pain when I was younger, and I was prescribed misindole night for, for my period pain. That became a big problem when I was in high school. I'd get my Macindol night during the day and be trying to study for exams as well, and it was just knocking me out. Um, when Code Neurofen Plus came on the scene later when I was a bit older, I was using that as well. And um, that seemed to help, a bit of a dry mouth, but that helped as well. And then, I mean, when you have it at home, and I will admit some nights I didn't sleep very well, I thought I'd have a Neurofen Plus. I'm an educated pharmacist and I'm doing that. So I wonder what people who perhaps don't have that health literacy but feel like, you know, it helps me sleep, I might take that as well, could be doing as well. Um, so other options for primary dysmenorrhea, non-medical options. So um, heat, TENS, acupuncture, acupressure, spinal manipulation, um, herbal and dietary preparations. Um, the um, gynaecologist in Geelong speaks highly of magnesium for girls with primary dysmenorrhea as an option. Um, so some randomised controlled trials have actually shown pain reduction with these, these methods, but the studies were limited in size and, and quality, so more research needs to be done. And again, Chinese herbal medication, exercise and psychological behavioural interventions have shown benefit in small trials, but more, more work needs to be done. All right, so musculoskeletal injury, so acute injury, we need to remember our RISA, everyone can remember that, I'm assuming, rest, ice, compression, elevation, referral if required. Um, first line analgesia is paracetamol. NSAIDs um, they have a theoretical risk of um, inhibiting muscle repair by the negative effects they have on the um, satellite cell populations. So this is the muscle stem cell responsible for repair and maintenance of skeletal muscle. So there's that theoretical risk that it might impede, impede um, um, repair, especially in younger, younger groups. Um, they shouldn't be used for longer than 48 hours. And again, no one NSAID is better than the other. Um, but non-pharmacological me methods need to be really taken into, into account and considered here. So physiotherapy, so exercise is really important for rehabilitation as long as it's not done too soon. Um, ice, all those types of things. Um, heat and massage are contraindicated in the first 48 hours though because they can do more harm than good. Um, so when I was working full-time in pharmacy, one of the most common requests for combined analgesics containing codeine was for dental pain, legitimate and non-legitimate. I think it was used quite often as an excuse. We used to record down, um, you know, we'd say to him, when are you off to see your dentist? I've got this hole in my tooth. I need, you know, the codeine, Nurofen Plus. When are you off to see your dentist? on oh, next week, we'd record that down. They'd come in next week. How did you go at the dentist? Oh, whoops. I'd forgotten I'd said that's when I was going right, you know. So um, obviously you need to avoid foods that provoke pain. So really sweet foods, hot and cold foods, avoid them. Advise about analgesia. So quite often dental pain, there's um, inflammation. So NSAIDs are suitable if they're not contraindicated, of course, with other medications. Um, it's important to cover any obvious cavities with an inert material, so chewing gum can be used. There's also this thing called dentist in a box I think you can still get that you can cover over. Um, top topical anaesthetics could be appropriate, but referral to a dentist ASAP is the most important 
important factor. So these are just measures to get them through until they can get into a, to a dentist. Um, cold and flu. I think too much in pharmacy we tend, or not just in pharmacy, we get requests for combination cold and flu tablets, you know. I want a cold and flu tablet. I want a day and night formulation. When you talk about their symptoms, what are your symptoms? They say, I've only got a blocked nose, but they still want the day and night formulation. So there's a lot of medications in there that they're getting unnecessarily for, not for any, um, to treat any symptoms. So I think it's important to think about what the actual symptoms are and, and supply medications to treat the symptoms rather than a, a combination, combination product. So often people didn't have aches or pains or headaches, but they're requesting a day and night formulation that had paracetamol and codeine in it and using it inappropriately. Um, chronic pain. I'm not going to talk too much about that because Malcolm's here to talk about chronic pain, but just with respect to pharmacy, um, the role of opioids in chronic pain is a non-cancer pain um, management is really limited, and as I said, Malcolm will talk more, more about that. But um, experience suggests that opioids work in only one in three patients and that they reduce pain intensity by 30 to 50% at best. Um, and in patients taking opioids for chron chronic non-malignant pain, about 80% um, have at least one adverse effect. So sometimes we need to think about are we doing more harm than good. Um, from a pharmacist's um, perspective, it's really important to educate a patient about the role of medications in chronic non-cancer pain. The fact that they only have a small, a small role and and um, small part of a big pie, I suppose, of treatment. We should be discussing lifestyle modifications, including diet and exercise. So, research has shown that processed, sugary foods can cause inflammation, and that alcohol can actually be neurotoxic to, um, as well. So, can cause um, ne uh, worsen neuropathic pain. And so we need to be discussing non-pharmacological options, so including heat, massage, psychotherapies, physiotherapy, osteotherapy, or osteo osteopathy, all those other things. Um, oh yeah, I forgot about the internet. <laughs> so it might be worth as a pharmacist talking to the patient about developing a pain management plan. Um, there's a link to that. That goes to the MPS pain management plan, but it's something that a pharmacist can sit down and start the process with with a patient and then they can continue that on with their, their GP. They can take that on to their GP and, and discuss what, what um, more appropriate options and perhaps discuss about their prescribed medications as well. Um, in pharmacy too, we have professional services that can be used to help aid with pain management. So meds checks, we can be offering meds checks to help with pain management, home medication reviews. And there's also some pharmacy pain management programs, e.g. PainWise, which I don't know if people are aware of, is run by Joyce McSwan, a Queensland pharmacist. Well, she's up in the Gold Coast, PHN. So there's different options that we can offer with regard to professional services in pharmacy as well. And of course, trying to link in and being aware of support groups and patient information in for your area. So Move Australia, the National Prescribing Source, uh, Service, has lots of good patient resources. Pain Australia, I'm sure there's plenty of others that I've missed. And it's important to know about your local pain service as well and what's available and how patients can access, access that too. Um, complementary medicines for pain. So fish oil has some evidence in arthritis, but we need to be making sure we're getting the right dose. So often a lot of the products are really underdosed. Um, or you need to take nine capsules to get the right dose. So for inflammation, it's recommended by the arthritis groups that you need at least 2.7 grams of um, omega, total omega-3, so the EPA and DHA. So you really needed those concentrated fish oils. Um, some people can't tolerate the side effects. I don't know if people here have tried it. I've had the liquid one. Oh, it's disgusting and fishy after aftertaste. Um, you do need to be mindful there's a theoretical risk of increased risk of bleeding and you do need to take it for at least three months to get the full effect. Turmeric has some um, limited evidence, but anecdotally it's having some, some people find it has good effect um, as an anti-inflammatory. Um, there is limited good quality studies, but so watch this space perhaps for more um, better conducted studies to show more evidence. It has a reasonable safe um, profile. Um, so it might be worth trialling um, if people can't tolerate or um, are contraindicated for NSAIDs. You do need to be careful with warfarin still, as with everything. Um, and you need, need to be aware that turmeric has different bioavailability with different formulations, so some, some are actually better than others. 
Um, glucosamine and chondroitin, quite limited evidence and mainly for osteoarthritis of the knee. I think the take-home message here is do your research perhaps before recommending any complementary medicines to make sure of the evidence, risks, benefits and costs sometimes can be a factor. So I guess my key message is make sure you validate the pain with the person. Um, even if you know you think it's mild, sometimes it can have a big effect on their, their life, so be empathetic. Remember non-pharmacological options and lifestyle factors. Give, make sure you educate and give realistic expectations as to what ex to expect from pain management, especially with medication. So how long it's going to take to work, how long it's going to, going to work for, what kind of level of, their, of relief they can expect. I think in society at the moment we expect to be pain free and that's actually not really realistic I suppose and it's important to remember that pain is there for a reason, it's a protective factor so sometimes it's good to have a little bit of pain. And make sure you get them to come back to see you or go to the GP if they don't get adequate relief from their medication. Thank you.